Good morning, fellow privateers. Welcome to the week ahead preview. Coming at you from uh, the U.S., somewhere in the Midwest. Had some big storms over the weekend. Summer's coming to an end. Kids are going back to school in the next couple of weeks. Got a daughter entering her first year at uni, which will be exciting. Dropping her off at school, moving her in two weeks time. So I might not be doing the video or I'll be doing the video quite early um, on September 1st. And uh, yeah, so things are, you know, people are, it seems like people are getting back. This, a lot of the high school sports have started. So vacation is kind of came to an abrupt end and summer seems to be a be over here in the, at least in the Midwest. You know, and one of the things that, that this might actually, uh, we might see a, a slight change in liquidity and, and, you know, people back in the saddle and, and, uh, you know, getting, re-engaging themselves in the market. Um, you know, even last week you could see some of these moves were very illiquid. And uh, I think this coming week and, and going forward, um, we might see, a, a, you know, a slight improvement in liquidity. And there's plenty of event risk, you know, over this next month. I, I think I read that there are 19 or 21 central bank meetings in the month of September alone. And we will do a special September uh, central bank central bank preview Um Maybe I'll try to put that out this week if I have time, because um, there's you know, quite a few, and and uh, you know, with every central bank out trying to outdub each other, we're at an important point in the cycle where uh, where things could really, uh, you know, markets could move on on any of these uh, any of these meetings. I'm trying to find this Huawei article from. Um, I believe it was on Friday. I don't know why I can't find this thing. Let me go back. Anyhow, we'll talk about that. So we'll talk about the event risk <clears throat> coming up this week. There's not a lot on the actual economic calendar. Um, however, uh, we're at the end of the week, Thursday, I believe the Jackson Hole Symposium starts on Thursday afternoon and then runs through Saturday. And uh, Jerome Powell's comments, and any, really any of the global central bankers' comments, you know, throughout that symposium, the three-day symposium, will be uh, very carefully watched. Um, I saw a headline: J.P. Morgan to brief clients on volatility in equity markets. Surely the short-term bottom is in. If they have to, uh, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's this Marco. Kalanovic is going to be holding a press conference about, uh, you know, like a conference call about recent market volatility. And I haven't read anything about it yet, but I would, I would imagine he'd be talking about, the, you know, as the VIX goes up, liquidity, depth of market goes down, that sort of thing. He, he talks a lot about market depth and, and, uh, and you know, negative gamma type positioning. Um the Huawei news. So on Friday, I believe it was Friday, it was announced late Friday that there is an extension of an, uh, another 90 day extension for, uh, for Huawei. And, you know, that is a positive for these stagnant trade talks between China and the U S I would think that they're going to try to, uh, give China a little bit more rope in exchange for China buying U.S. agricultural products. So that's kind of part of the deal that seems to be playing out right now. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, like, like I said, the key really is Powell. And a lot of people are saying that it, you should pay close attention to Richard Clarida. Um, seems like he's probably the most respected after Williams, Williams's gaffe a couple of weeks ago, and Powell, <clears throat> you know, at the, uh, you know, Powell at the uh, the last uh, 
FOMC meeting where he uh, basically, you know, they cut interest rates 25 basis points, which was pretty much 100% priced in. And it's a, but he then said it's a mid cycle adjustment policy. This is, does not signal the start of a full blown easing cycle. And, you know, things went a little crazy after that meeting. Um, and that led to that big equity downdraft that started, uh, you know, right, right around the meeting. Um, and then, and really got going, I guess it was July 31st and then August 1st. And so, um, you know, I think the world will be listening and, and watching this Jackson hole very, very closely. You know, it's probably one of the more important um, Jackson Holes and we had in a few years. I remember there used to be some really good trades on Jackson Hole meetings and then things just kind of died to death. But now, um, you know, this year's theme is, is kind, of, uh, kind of interesting. It's called Challenges for Monetary Policy. Um, you know, central, central banks keep cutting rates in a bid to stir up activity, but all that's really happening is a, a mounting pile of negative yielding debt. Um, I think we're approaching 17 trillion in negative yielding bonds globally. Um, you know, that, that alone just indicates how gloomy, um, people's perceptions are of the, uh, of the state of the world economy. Um, the short end, uh, yield curve, the yield curve, the, the front, sorry, the front end yield curve, uh, in the U S is now pricing in three cuts between now and year end seems a little aggressive, but, uh, you know, this is a tough one to get, to get in front of. I do wonder if there'll be some, and we'll look at the charts shortly, if there'll be some profit taking in some of these, um, some of the bonds like, uh, you know, stocks have had a nice bounce off that, uh, we had that big down day on Wednesday and then it held the 200 day again and came back up and had a good, had a good day Friday and bonds, you know, started selling off a little bit. Um, I think mainly triggered by, there was a headline that, um, about, you know, some fiscal, um, stimulus coming out of, uh, Germany, Europe. And, uh, I think it was Germany and, uh, you know, Bunz took a, took a quick tumble on, um, at least for an hour or so. You know, this, the market's definitely getting a little bit, uh, a little bit overcooked on the top side when it comes to uh, bonds and bonds, and we'll look at those in a minute. Um, as far as other uh, event risk, uh, nothing really coming out today. We've got policy minute, meeting minutes out of the RBA on Tuesday. We've got FOMC meeting minutes out of uh, or on Wednesday, and we got CAD CPI on Wednesday. Thursday is important. We have um, France, German, and EU and US uh, flash manufacturing. Uh, actually, the European ones are, are manufacturing and service PMIs. And uh, and then the the headlines will start hitting the wires later on later that day um, for Jackson Hole. And we'll try to get you a lineup of all the speakers. Um, Friday's New Zealand retail sales, CAD retail sales, and Powell speaks at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, 1400 GMT. So the world will be watching. They'll be listening. Um, you know, he has a chance to kind of, uh, you know, set, set the policy path straight. Um, you know, he's just done such a poor job of, uh, managing investors, expectations of, you know, the world's largest central bank. But remember Clarida, Richard Clarida is that I think he's, he also is, <clears throat> he's fairly dovish. He's also uh, one to pay attention to. I saw something on Friday as well. The U S economic surprise index. Um, I don't have the chart handy, but it's been ticking up, which is interesting. And it's, you know, it's really has been outperforming, um, most of the world as far as, uh, economic surprises. And, you know, it makes me think that when I look at some of the daily sentiment in U S 10 years and 30 years, they're in the eighties and nineties. Um, let me see what the 30 year 
T-bond was 93, and after Friday's little sell-off, uh, it's down to 85. Uh, the Bund is still at 86. That too, that came from 94. So when you start getting into these high 80s into the 90s in sentiment readings, I really start paying attention. Gold is still at 84. Um, dollar index is at 86. You know, so I, that's I, I start worrying a little bit about the sentiment being, you know, a bit too stretched. So let's take a look at the charts, get to those. Here's the S&P. We talked about it uh, Wednesday, the big down day on Wednesday, held the 200 day on Thursday and then bounced. Um, if we look at the weekly, it's the third weekly decline. Um, we almost had an inside week, but not quite. Um, I don't know. I don't know the next direction. To, to me, it feels like the, you know, we're going to get a bit more of a bounce. You know, maybe we go back up and we test uh, early in the week ahead of Jackson Hole. We test these highs, this 29.40 level. Um, you know, it did have a strong day. It was up about 1.3%. NASDAQ was up close to 2%. Um, I got too many FIBOs in here. Let me remove some of these. Um, we talked about this, I believe, last week. Held the 200 day to the tick. We had a nice bounce. Or that was a couple weeks ago. We had a nice bounce. Then the big downdraft on Wednesday, Thursday, nice little reversal bar, and then pretty much straight up. Um, so again, same type of thing, maybe up to this fractal. Um, I could even see it stretching, getting up to this uh, three quarter fib ahead of uh, ahead of Jackson Hole, assuming Donald Trump doesn't. Uh, tweet something that would uh, lend to risk off. <clears throat> Here is the 10 year US yield chart. You can see here we put a low in at 147 on Thursday. And then we kind of match these highs. So this is a little break trade here. Uh, let's call it 160. We closed at 155. So another five, another five bips higher. This kind of looks like there's an old low there right here, fractal low, we took that out and then kind of ran out of steam. Um, I would imagine people will will start selling bonds with break that. And here is the daily, this is the futures. Um, <clears throat> and something, I don't know what the hell this is. Let me, let me refresh this. Let me refresh this. This is not something that looks very funky here. Um, ten year futures. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that chart. Um, let's see if we take a look at a weekly instead. Yeah, let's look at the weekly. It's better. Uh, you can see here. These charts look a little screwy. Let's go over to um, let's go over to the Bund. Okay, there's a Bund weekly. Here's a Bund daily. Had a little bit of a made a new just. I think we just made a new marginal high, 179.11. No, not quite. We pretty much matched the high from Thursday, and we sold off on that fiscal stimulus talk, and then kind of closed mid-range. So it's, you know, it's indecisive. It's a red bar. We have only seen a couple over the past few weeks. So um, tactically, we're actually, we sold some buns and we sold some 10-year notes on, uh, on, uh, on Friday. So that's something we, yeah, this is really screwed up. I don't know what the hell is going on with these charts. <laughs> Trading view, what are you doing? Um, so we, yeah, we've we've tactically shorted some some buns and some ten years and some thirty years, and we're just using new highs as a stop. We're not going to get cute with this, you know. Between the sentiment, there were some demarc indicators that I don't have here on Trading View. Um, a few different things, you know, telling us 
I mean, I can't tell you. There, there was a Google search about inverted yield curve, huge spike in that. There was, um, you know, all, all sorts of, everyone is talking about inverted yield curve and a recession is on the, you know, is imminent. Um, New York Times yield curve mentions, there was a chart on uh, over the weekend on that as well. A huge spike in that. So it just, this it's all that anyone's talking about. And this is when we like to take the other side. And uh, it's it's a pretty good risk reward um, as far as we're concerned. If I look at the 10-year yield, well, here we can look at the bun because that chart is actually, is actually uh, cleaner. Uh, let's go to the daily. I'm just leaving a stop over these highs. <clears throat> you know, it's you're risking 50, 60 pips, ticks on it. And, uh, you know, I do think we can back and fill you know, we can get down to this 15, 15 day moving average pretty quickly. Um, you know, especially if liquidity kind of comes back into the market. Um, there might be people like us that think this is overdone. It's a parabolic chart. So if you want to play it safe, I would say you could wait and you can sell it through these lows, two days of lows. It's interesting. So it's the, the highs were pretty much the same and the lows were pretty much the same two days in a row. Um, so that might be a little bit safer selling weakness. You know, you don't have to be the first one in. We we got involved pretty much right here on Friday and it was looking like it was going to sell off some more and then it kind of popped back and back to our entry. So um, we think it's good risk reward. Uh, gold's, you know, pretty much the same chart. If you look at it, very parabolic move higher. Um, we entered a short on Friday and that this was a little bit of a, you know, we're wrong above these highs, 1540, we'll call it, um, looking for a pullback to 1480 to 1485 back to that 15 day. Um, let's go over the currencies. Um, sterling was the best performing currency last week. So sterling kind of went into the sideways, you know, all the pessimism was built in with the hard Brexit and the deadline, October 31st and blah, blah, blah. And we started seeing some sideways price action. <clears throat> uh, one of the models we, one of the models that we use was showing, um, a bit of a turn. Um, we were waiting for more of a technical signal, but we got the fundamental bit was, was calling for at least a base, um, an improvement in some of the fundamentals. Um, and then we, Trump is tweeting as we speak, talks are going well with China, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyhow, so with the British pound, we took a stab at along here on uh, Thursday. It hasn't really done much, but if we get a close over this 15 day, I don't see why we can't you know, go pretty quickly up about a hundred, um, what is that? 105, 110 points, you know, maybe, maybe even back up back to these lows, 123.80. Um, so it, you know, it, it performed the best, the Euro on the other hand, uh, performed the worst. Um, and that brings us to the Euro Sterling chart. The Euro Sterling put in, let's go to the weekly. This is a bearish engulfing folks, just barely made a new marginal high. We closed just below the previous week's low. So that is something that we're, you know, we are looking to sell some rallies. I don't like selling it after I see a weekly bar like this. I can't sell this in Asia now and just go out and hit the bid because generally you're going to get some sort of little bit of a rally, but overall bigger picture, um, you know, it stopped the low on the low last week was these old highs as well. So 90, 90 looks pretty important to me. So we'll sell a little bit on a rally and then we'll look to sell some through, uh, last week's low and our model, uh, like I was saying is, is become fundamentally bullish, the British pound. And, uh, so that goes well with our Euro sterling. Um, so, uh, one other one is kind of interesting. We like looking at this dollar stock. We've talked about this in the past as a um, a good, a real dollar move type trade. Look at these highs here. 
if we break through nine, uh, let's call it 970, 9.70, um, I think you're going to see the dollar index break out. I think you're going to see the euro take out the lows. Um, so pay attention to this dollar stock. We had a, um, we had a bullish engulfing week and we are approaching these old fractals and old highs. Um, so, you know, we like to look at the outside weeks, the, the, the engulfing weeks, but we also like to look at the inside weeks. So let's go through a few of those. Um, here's Aussie dollar. Um, well, that's today. So that's looks like Aussie's up a little bit here on the open. If this thing is ticking correctly. Um, uh, is that, yeah. So we had an inside, we had an inside week in Aussie. We also had a, uh, the other one that was interesting, I believe it was dollar China, which would make some sense. Yeah. So here's the weekly, we had inside week in dollar China. So the way we play these inside weeks is we play breaks of either, either the high, well, so we could play the top side breaks above 711, 712 or below call it 698. And in Aussie, we would be playing the break is 67.30, and we could just call it here these two highs that match up around 68.20. Um, let me write that down quick because these are trades that I need to put in. Um, you know, so a bit of calm in in some of these pairs after you know they've had some big moves, so that's expected. Um, what else are we looking at? Dollar yen. What's dollar yen up to these days? Had a nice little reversal week. Um, you know, kind of following, pretty much following risk. Um, Aussie yen, same type of thing, a green week. Your Aussie, this is something that um, we were long of and we got lucky and got out of some near 168. Then rebought a little bit at 164. That's not going so well. Um, you know, if, if, if risk does rally, if the tensions between uh, Trump and, uh, and Xi, uh, if the tensions, you know, decrease a bit, uh, I'm just reading, he's, he's tweeting right now, actually. Um, you know, I could see, I could see a, a risk, you know, some risk on, and your Aussie is a good, um, definitely a good way to play that by, you know, by selling your own buying Aussie. Um, what other charts were of interest? Euro Swissy, I think it's just been shitting the bed. You know, here's another low weekly close. There's just no bounce at all. You know, once we broke this 200 week moving average, we've been just drifting lower for the past couple of months. And, you know, we're now making a low the lowest uh, weekly close since back in 17, I believe that was May, June of 17. And the Euro is the same thing. If you look at a Euro weekly, um, you know, this is a, this is the lowest weekly close we've seen in the Euro since way back here, May of 17. So market's betting against Europe, that's for sure. Um, and they're going to test the Swiss National Bank because obviously the strong Swiss is not good for the country, and uh, I would imagine that the Swiss National Bank will do a combination of uh, cutting rates and probably start intervening um, a bit more aggressively. You know, they've been very secret squirrel about their intervention, and uh, I'm not saying they're going to put a floor in, but they they can't. Their economy will get fucking destroyed in with uh, the Swiss franc this strong. <clears throat> so they're gonna have to do something. I don't know, you know, I think cut rates and, and, uh, and then intervene, and, you know, maybe they get it, maybe they, you know, here's a weekly, maybe they get it back to the midpoint of, you know, this whole range, kind of 125 down to what we saw. Well, that's a Euro, hold on. Um, 120 was that high in Euro Swiss, which was the old floor, funny enough. You know, so maybe you can get this back to the midpoint, you know, somewhere in the kind of 115 area, 112 to 115. 
Um, what else? Let's uh, make sure I cover the engulf things. The inside weeks. Yeah, I think that pretty much should wrap it up. Um, you'll hear from us on the European Open. Like I said, we're, we're all back in the saddle. Uh, we're engaged. I think a lot of the market is coming back from their summer holidays. And, uh, you know, stay nimble. This is still, this is very much a trader's market. Volatility is elevated. Um, let's take a quick look at the... Um, the VIX, I think, where did the VIX close on Friday? It was back down to 18. You know, it got up to about 24, almost 25. Watch that level. If 25 breaks, we're going quickly up to these old highs that we saw in uh, last year at the end of 2018. Right, so good luck this week. Uh, you'll hear from us. I will try to do a central bank video at some point, um, either this week or next. Again, there's... I believe there's 19 central bank meetings in September, so we got to get ready for that. All right, we'll speak to you later. Have a great day. Cheers.